where you are from. My name is Eric Scheninger. I am an associate partner with the International Center for Leadership for Education. And I'm really excited today to talk to you about engagement strategies for teaching and learning in a remote world. You know, as we all grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic, there, there's a lot of uncertainty. Many schools have decided, you know what, we're going to start remote. Uh, some have started face-to-face, -face. some are implementing hybrid. But on the drop of a dime, we might be going back to remote or coming out of it. The key here today is the strategies that I'm going to present uh, are effective whether or not we are in a remote world or not. But I will tell you that uh, past two days, I have facilitated two full day workshops uh, with a school district, and I've been able to implement a lot of these engagement strategies. So as I uh, discuss them, I want you to think about your role either as a teacher implementing them or as a school leader and how you will support your teachers in implementing these strategies. Again, my name is Eric. If you want to connect with me on social media, there is my Twitter handle. Uh, I tweet a lot. So if you do follow me and I tweet too much for you, just unfollow me. It is professional. It's not personal. Uh, and if you want to share anything on social media, please use that hashtag DigiLead. Uh, I will try to leave time for questions at the end, but I'm easy to get a hold of. So you can tweet, pin, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever you want, email, I'm easy to get a hold of. So please, if you have questions and we don't get to them today, please reach out. So let's really dive in. You know, as we think about engagement and we think about designing activities, this is so important because when we went to remote learning in the spring, none of us were trained. This was all new and we did the best job we could. But the fact remains, a lot of kids did not log on. And those that did, if you have conversations with them, will tell you that mm, they weren't really engaged. And I've talked to a lot of kids to get, as I've been working with schools and districts since the pandemic started. And it's really important that we have engagement at the top of our minds. Because if we want to get kids to learn, if we want to lessen potential achievement gaps, we have to make sure that kids are fully vested in the learning experience. So what we're going to work through in this short 30 minute session today is we're going to talk about the need for relevance, you know, focus on the why of learning. Then we're going to move to discourse. You know, how do we leverage technology to foster meaningful conversation in remote environments? We'll talk about collaboration. How do we create those conditions for positive interdependence? Flexibility, you know, it's a golden opportunity right now for remote to relinquish the familiar rigidity nature of in-person school. Personalization, you know, how do we really begin to implement, implement high effect strategies that blend learning for our kids? And finally, feedback. You know, how are we giving timely feedback to support and build motivation? So these are the drivers for what we're going to discuss uh, this afternoon, this evening, this morning, wherever you're at, but they're really important even in a non-remote way, but they're even more critical now. So as we think about where we are and where we want to be, let's really jump in with relevance. And, and this is one of our, you know, foundational focus areas here at the International Center. Relationships, rigor, and relevance. You know, when we think about relevance, relevance is the purpose of learning. You know, if kids don't see the value, if they don't see the meaning in what they're learning, chances are they're not going to be engaged. And if they're not engaged, they might not be learning. So as we think about it, it's not just acquiring knowledge. It's easy to create a video and have kids watch it asynchronously. It's easy to have a live uh, lecture. That's acquiring knowledge. But it's what do they do with it? How do they apply it? How are they making those interdisciplinary uh, applications? And finally, how are they applying their learning to real world predictable and unpredictable situations? We are in an unpredictable, unpredictable world right now. It's a golden opportunity to create those learning tasks and experiences where kids are really getting that value out of their learning. If a lesson is relevant, you know, yeah, kids can tell you what they learned, but they're also going to be able to tell you why they learned it and how they will use it out side of school, just like you all. You're spending your time 
here in this webinar with me, you want relevance, you want meaning, you want purpose, you want something that you can use tomorrow, thinking about how we bring in current events, connecting to our students' lives, connecting to the challenges and the opportunities that are inherent right now, looking at facets of the fourth industrial revolution, automation, advanced robotics, artificial intelligence that's here right now, thinking about problems that our learners can solve to chart their path to the future. You know, as we think about relevance, you know, we have to really ask ourselves, are we preparing kids for something with what we're doing in a remote environment or are we preparing them for anything? And that's the key. You know, COVID-19 has taught us now more than ever, doesn't matter what field we're in, but we have to be prepared for every anything, especially our learners. So how do you do that? You do that by taking a critical lens to your practice. We need to look at our lessons. We need to look at our questions. We need to look at the tasks kids are engaged in. We need to look at student work. We need to look at assessment. We need to look at professional learning. We also need to look at observation and evaluation. But how do we create that common language, common vision, common expectations to bring relevance into what we do every day? The rigor relevance framework. The rigor relevance framework provides a great guide uh, a great sort of litmus test to see where your tasks are. Yes, we want to be focused on levels of thinking, but for engagement purposes, it's that vertical axis. How are we getting kids to apply their thinking in meaningful ways? And ask yourselves, does this question, does this task get kids to apply? Apply across disciplines to real predictable and unpredictable situations. The heart of relevance, the heart of engagement, is moving kids out of A to B and to D. So as we think about that, and we look about the seamless role that technology plays in engagement, technology in itself is an engaging tool. But think about the verbs. You know, Think about what we want kids to be able to do. Think about what they wanna do in terms of how uh, they will find the work meaningful, meaningful and valuable. You know, With their time, we want them to stay engaged on task and learn. So this is just the same framework, rigor relevance, with all the different technology and verbs plastered all throughout. But ask yourself, how are kids constructing new knowledge in meaningful ways? How are they able to learn in ways with technology they couldn't without it? And how does technology for you as a teacher administrator improve what you do? Let's talk about discourse. You know, with engagement, we want kids talking. Uh, we want them collaborating. It's so important. And as we think about discourse, I'm going to go back to you know all the different verbs that you saw on the Rigor Allen's framework and think about all these pathways that you could structure your lessons, your tasks, your uh, digital tools, your assessments to get kids talking. You know, that's the beauty of technology is that could be a pathway to get kids to co-create to uh, uh, be engaged in turn and talk. So as you look at all these verbs, and as you're planning for remote teaching and remote learning, ask yourself, how does the verb really align itself in a way that creates discourse, that gets kids talking, that gets kids communicating, collaborating? So as we think about all that, here are some of my favorite tools that I use with adult learners to encourage discourse and collaboration. Uh, I used all of these over the past two days. Uh, so what I will do is I'll have a slide, I'll have a question, and then I'll have them talk in a breakout room, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then after they discuss, I bring them back, I have the same question and a link to one of these tools. If you've never used them, never checked them out, they are easy to use and they automatically create the conditions for discourse and collaboration. Mentimeter, Go Soapbox, the purple thing, Google Forms, Yo Teach. If you ever used today's Meet, Yo Teach is an alternative. It creates a back channel. Uh, Lino and Padlet are digital post-it notes with different uh, layers of added collaboration, such as video, text, audio. And that one in the bottom middle, that is Answer Garden, where uh, students can submit their answers in a word cloud and uh, submit their answers via text and create a word cloud. Here's the thing, everybody. If I'm using these tools, they're ridiculously easy. 
and sometimes I'll use more one than the other. Uh, right now, I am in uh, the Salt Lake City, Utah area. I'll be working with the school district tomorrow, face-to-face uh, -face actually, and I will be using Mentimeter and Padlet. That's it. So it's not how many tools you use for discourse and collaboration, it's the degree to which you use them. Another way to increase discourse and collaboration are breakout rooms. I love the Zoom feed, uh, the breakout rooms in Zoom. Uh, yesterday and the day before, uh, on average, I had 300 teachers from the school district that were with me all day. And we broke it up an hour, half hour off, hour, half hour off. But during the session, during each hour module, I had them go to breakout rooms two or three times. And what I would do is I'd unmute all their mics, I randomly put them in breakout rooms, and there was over 50, and then they were discussing the questions or uh, working to solve the different tasks that I set out. I would then uh, randomly jump into them so I could monitor the discourse, and it was awesome, everybody. You know, these teachers, they were talking, they were brainstorming, they were answering each other's questions, exactly what you would want to see in a classroom. And then when I brought them out of the breakout room, that's when they actually then used the tools that I showed on the previous slide and shared their responses. All of them had that opportunity to share. Discourse, collaboration, communication, it was awesome. And, you know, using the breakout rooms in Zoom, very easy. I also hear it's easy in Google Meets. But in my mind, if we're going to create engaging, synchronous live experiences uh, for remote learning, we need to use the breakout rooms. By the way, one question I got yesterday was, well, Eric, what about if cyberbullying is taking place or any other inappropriate content? Once you're in the breakout room in Zoom, there is a button on the top left where a student could hit it and for asking a question or signaling that, hey, I need you as the teacher to get in there. Yesterday, teachers used it when, with me when they had questions and so on and so forth. So there are those added uh, safeguards. However, with discourse and collaboration for engagement, you want to make sure you have strong norms, norms for conduct and behavior before you begin to go into these different activities. Now let's go to collaboration. You know, I mentioned that a little bit. You know, discourse is the talking, you know, getting kids, do you turn and talk? Um, having those conversations, the, the brainstorming. When we think about collaboration, you know, it really goes to how do we start establishing cooperative learning activities online. This is a summary of the main elements of effective cooperative learning. You know, you want the main important thing for engagement, especially in this remote world, we want to focus on interpersonal and social skills. We want to promote interaction, positive interdependence. Uh, we want to make sure there's accountability. And that's why selecting the right tool is important. You know, maybe you want to use tools that sync with your LMS, with Google Classroom, uh, Schoology, uh, or Canvas, and use those features so you know who's responding. You can do that with Padlet. You can do that with some other tools because you want that accountability component, establishing those roles for each student before they go in. And I'll give you two examples in a minute uh, of face-to-face -face cooperative learning activities could work remotely, but also you want group processing. These are those main elements that we want to really spur uh, collaboration. You know, two activities that are great for cooperative learning in a remote environment, think, pair, share. Now, you have the ability in your breakout rooms to assign your kids to that breakout room. You know, you could also pair them up in a breakout room and then have them share in the chat box, or they can go share on a tool, or they could share using Flipgrid. That's another tool that I probably should have had on the other thing, but Flipgrid's another great one to do your think, pair, share. But this is not new, everybody. So we have to remember, you know, what has worked face-to-face. -face. In many cases, we can transition to a digital environment. Another great activity is the jigsaw activity. So you have your whole group, um, you know, where you start down at the bottom, that home group. And then they break out into their own specific activity where they're bringing a piece to that puzzle together. So if you're working on one large concept, you're breaking it up to mini concepts. That's what the kids will be working on either synchronously in a breakout room or asynchronously. But if you want that cooperation, 
It's either got to be through the breakout room or possibly using a Google Doc. Then after a set amount of time, they come back to the home group and you put all the pieces together. Again, we've used these activities before. I love doing jigsaws uh, with groups when I'm doing uh, workshops that are even non-digital, but I use the digital tools. Lino is one of my favorite tools uh, to bring that work together uh, after a jigsaw activity. Next, let's talk about personalization. You know, why is personalization so important to engaging kids? This is our vision of personalized learning. As you'll see, there is no technology on this image. You can personalize learning without technology. Think about the most important, important word, word, personal. If we make learning personal, that's relevance. That comes back to what we talked about before. Personalized is not about putting all kids on a device, having them do an adaptive learning tool at the same time where there's no discourse. Personalization is about the teacher, how you teach, why you teach. It's about administrator impact, parents, the culture of your building, the resources you have, budgets, technology, equity, social emotional learning. But we also have to look at how are we making instruction more personalized? How are our pedagogical approaches focusing on that personal aspect? How is curriculum changing? And how are we using data? Data to give kids what they need when they need it. The key elements of personalization that are central to engagement. Voice, choice, path, pace, and place. The tools I showed you before, that's all about voice. Other tools like Padlet uh, allow kids to choose how they're going to respond. Choice could be creating an assignment and letting your kids choose the right tool for the right task. What we've learned in a remote world is allowing kids to go at their own pace, to follow or determine a trajectory, a path that best meets their needs. And that place right now could be outside, could be home. What does this look like from a teacher angle? How do we begin to make the pivot to shift from low agency? Low agency is there is no voice choice. Aspects of path, pace, place. Low agency is that's the way we've always done it. Not saying that's bad, everybody. We don't want to reside on the low agency side. So as educators, as teachers, as leaders, the goal here is to see what is manageable for you. Where is there opportunity when you look at the, your practice in the classroom or your practice as a school or practice across your district, where is that opportunity to move from left low agency to, I'm sorry, from right low agency to left high agency? What could you begin to work on tomorrow? And then over time, how can you begin to expand those opportunities to personalize learning for your kids? Along with personalization is flexibility. You know, flexible pathways, flexible methodologies, flexible timeframes. So as we think about flexibility and we think about how important that is for our kids, we can go back to UDL. And here are three principles from Universal Design for Learning that are really important in creating flexible learning environments. We're, right now, we're focused on engagement. We want to offer options and supports to stimulate motivation and enthusiasm. One thing that I did during my uh, two, uh, two trainings the past two days is I had the chat box and I had how I knew people was engaged, all the comments in the chat box, but also the private messages. The private messages that were coming to me for one-on-one -on -one support as the rest of the groups were working. We want representation for thinking about different ways that kids can present what they've learned and action expression, you know, options that support everyone to create, learn, and share. So as we think about flexibility, you know, one of the great ways, and this is a one way to personalize, is blended learning. Now, blended instruction, many people confuse with blended learning. Blended instruction is what the teacher does with tech. For example, you have all your kids use Kahoot. I'm not saying that's bad. I would want to look at the scaffolding. Uh, are we asking our kids high order questions? But if all kids are using the same tool the same way at the same time, okay, that's not blended learning. Blended learning is where kids ha use technology to have control over path, pace, and place. There's a big difference. So as we think about blended learning and we think about what we want for our kids, 
you know, at the International Center, we really focus on rigorous blended learning. We want to challenge kids to think. We want them to construct new knowledge, but we also want them to apply their thinking in meaningful ways. You know, rigorous blended learning is about differentiated instruction and pacing. It's about personalizing their interests. It's about aligning virtual and classroom instruction. In your case right now, it's about aligning synchronous and asynchronous learning. It's about a balance between synchronous and asynchronous. Focused on the kid. Adaptable, authentic. That could be uh, the way which kids show what they've learned. That could be assessments. Um, that could be feedback, which we're going to end with in a minute. And developing a future-focused curriculum as well as assessments. As we think about what this looks like in a remote world, how we make it flexible to engage kids, it's taking what we know about remote learning and creating a model that works. And it's about finding that balance between synchronous and asynchronous instruction, creating those collaborative experiences that I talked about before, but also strategically utilizing adaptive learning tools that respond to the individual strengths and needs of all kids. Utilizing pathways such as station rotation, choice boards, playlists, the flipped classroom. Those are the four best, most, uh, I guess, uh, digestible ways, clear cut ways to create a blended learning experience for kids. Finally, let's talk about feedback. You know, kids want to know how well they're doing. Kids want to hear from you. Kids need support. Same thing with adult learners. And, and feedback is so important to the uh, growth trajectory of our kids and adults. So as we think about remote learning and we think about feedback, this is just a summary of what the research has told us. Feedback has to be timely. It has to be accurate and it has to be actionable. So the guiding questions for you are, how are you using your learning management system, your digital tools, or non-digital pathways to provide feedback to your kids? Feedback at this point is much more important than grading. It just is, because there's a lot of equity issues when it comes to grading. You know, these are just some uh, main points summarized by an article in Edutopia. And they looked at a, different, a lot of different uh, examples of research. So as you think about a remote world, think about how your feedback is specific. Number two, timely. The sooner, the better. Three, addresses the learner's advancement towards a goal. Four, present it carefully. Maybe you want to do it via text. Maybe you want to do it via Zoom. Um, maybe you're going to find another pathway to do that but also involve your kids in the process. Feedback should be a dialogue, not a monologue. It should be a collaborative experience and conversation. All right. So as I summarize this and then open up to questions, you know, we went through engagement and engagement is a big component of making remote learning work. And as we created this sort of guideline framework uh, at ICLA, you know, it really is about providing balance. You know, we got to think beyond synchronous on-screen learning, everybody. I'll tell you right now, I, uh, my eyes were all blurry yesterday after being in front of a screen. We got to remember our kids. We got to build in movement. We got to build in mindfulness. And we got to build in real engaging activities that stretch our kids' thinking outside the live. Uh, options. We also need to look at equity and make sure we're closing that digital divide. We got to focus on good, sound pedagogy to make learning relevant. We also have to provide professional learning for teachers and administrators, not just before school starts, but ongoing job embedded. That's what the research from Lyndon Darling Hammond, the Wallace Foundation, has time and time again said works, job embedded ongoing. And we got to bring our parents into the process, support them, engage them, family communication. Second to last slide, think about your professional learning. Think about the supports that you need as a teacher. Think about what you need in place as a school, as a district. Think about how we serve not just the educator needs, 
but the school and district needs. And that middle is what we should be striving towards because that is effective professional learning. All right, my last slide, and then we're going to see if there's any questions. Fast and Furious, um, if you want more information uh, about the work that we are doing to support schools and districts with hybrid, remote, blended learning, please feel free to reach out. Um, this has been some of the most fun I've had. I learned so much when I'm engaging, doing uh, Zoom sessions and so on and so forth. Um, love to have a conversation at the very least about it with you. Um, there's the link at the bottom, so you can uh, shoot us an email. Uh, I will get back to you. Uh, you get this information brief, and that's that. So I am going to stop sharing my screen, and we're going to see if there are any questions in the chat box. So I am going to get out of this which means you are only going to see my face. And let me scroll through. I don't know, Lori, if you have curated any of those questions or not. If so, let me know. If not, I will look through. We've got a question coming in from Dana, Eric, um, toward the bottom of the chat. Take a look at that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, feedback of kindergarten two and three students. To, okay. You know, one of the best ways is using Seesaw. Seesaw is one of the best apps um, that we I saw face to face, but is now being used in a remote environment because there, as kids are working, they can upload their work. They could use video, pictures, text. Seesaw is probably the best way, in my opinion, to get good, timely feedback to the little ones. And then parents can actually log into uh, those Seesaw accounts as well and uh, see the feedback that's being provided, and then determine what they need to do as a parent to support uh, their kid. Great question. Any other questions? Come on, everybody. Yes. We know you've got them. <laughs> you will be getting the webinar. You will be getting the recording. Uh, so you'll have all those slides. You'll have all this. So the answer, Judy, is yes. Ooh, that's a great question. Who asked that? Manuel, how can we attract young learners to really learn within themselves without, without the use of technology, depending on, okay. You know, the, the key is that parent outreach. You know, with your younger kids, you are, are really going to have to lean on your uh, families. It, it just how it is. Lots of independent reading choice reads, reflective questions, giving kids prompts, having them go and make observations uh, out in their natural, you know, around their home outside, writing about it, creating video, well, not videos, because that's what the tech piece, writing it down. So uh, uh, giving them authentic problems that are grade level appropriate for them to solve related to the concepts and the content. So uh, also looking at guided, uh, guided practice, independent practice. What do I mean by guided practice? You could create your sort of scaffolded notes that for your kids and then give them opportunities to practice by hand. But again, that's all well and good, but you still have to have those pathways to get the materials to you so that you can see where they are and provide them feedback. Other questions? Eric, you got a question from Cindy. Um, she asks, would you recommend any age group for breakout rooms? Ooh, <laughs> yes. You know, that's the thing. And these are some tough things. We have to understand that, you know, FERPA, COPA, SIPA, all in a nutshell, they're all the laws protecting privacy, student identity, all that stuff. So, you know, with your young learners, you know, uh, if you're gonna put them in a breakout room, you gotta make sure that you have those norms in place and that they're going to behave accordingly. You know, so you have to look at, you know, the guidelines that you have in place. Obviously you wanna make sure anytime you're using Zoom or Google Meets that parents have signed waivers. And, you know, I would limit uh, how many breakout rooms you use. You know, maybe you make them a little larger so that you can bump back and forth. In terms of the optimal space, the same concerns and challenges could arise. Like, let's say you have your kids in station rotation. 
or you have your kids in centers and you're working with one center on one side of the room on the other side of the room chaos could be happening well that chaos is going to happen no matter what whether you get there or not so the same sort of potential issues could arise but if you're asking me for age i shouldn't even say this because it's really your decision i'd say i'd be comfortable third grade on but i'm not saying they couldn't work in lower grades but i'm saying if you start building those norms and expectations kindergarten first grade second grade third grade on could be good but but again that's your call all right everybody um i think Oh, thank you, Jacqueline, for getting digital leadership last year. Nice. I love the plug for the book. So, um, and she had talked about what she was doing. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, everyone, if you got any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me. The goal was to keep this short and concise because I know you're busy. I know you have a lot on your plate. Um, if you want to have a conversation or ask me any questions, I'm easy to get a hold of. But uh, I'm going to sign off. Have a wonderful night, and thank you so much for everything that you're doing for kids and how you're getting through this. I cannot thank you enough. All right? Have a great day, everybody.